Well, good morning, Keystone Church. Hey, I am super excited that you have decided to join us uh, in worship this morning in this really, really odd setting. Uh, I am by myself here. There is no one here, but we're going to be presenting this as if someone is here and that you are all worshiping together. Isn't it so cool that we can have this, this type of thing that we have set up to where we can, we can come together and we can worship in different places connected by the same Holy Spirit that has always been there guiding us, uniting us, keeping us all together. So it is in that that we gather together, and I'm glad that you have blocked out this time. I want to encourage you during this time. Uh, first of all, don't neglect this time. Uh, set it up 1030 every Sunday that you're going to gather together like this in front of your TVs, in front of your phones, in front of your computers, however you're doing this. Don't do it as something that you're going to do later. Set the time in stone. Stay regular with the, the setting and keep doing what you're doing because uh, I think it'll be really important for your families and for you. And I encourage you to do this together as a family. Um, if you have kids and you are watching, then uh, know that we have made great efforts to also uh, put out the kids material that your kids would be learning downstairs at Keystone Kids. Um, you can get that directly after this service. It will start streaming on YouTube also, and uh, you can just watch on Facebook or on YouTube for those things. If you need more information about all that is happening here at Keystone Church, I want to encourage you now to get a resource that some of you have put off. The Keystone Church app has been up and going for quite a while and uh, is really, really a handy, incredible, neat uh, tool that we have here at Keystone Church that keeps everything uh, together and, and focused, and, and we have a, a list of prayer requests on there. If you are not getting the prayer request messages, then I want to encourage you to send me a text, email me somehow, uh, get a hold of me, and let me know that you want to be added to that, and I will add that, add you to that uh, right away. If you want to know uh, what events are going on um, when we're able to have events, those are on there also. But another really, really important uh, thing that happens on there right Right now that we've got to pay attention to is you are able to continue to give to Keystone Church on there. We have sent out the message. We are not closed. I have been more busy this week than I have been in a long time running, ministering, trying to do all that we can. Uh, the church is reaching out, still doing all that we can. We are functioning, although functioning differently. Therefore, the bills are still there, and we want to encourage you to give. If this is something that has been helpful at this time, then why don't you consider giving uh, there on the app? If you need to mail in a check, if you give that way, that's still perfectly fine. Uh, but all that will happen later on. And so uh, thank you so much for joining us in worship. Here's what I want to do. I want to start out by praying over you, praying for you. And uh, my goal, my hope is that this will be the most encouraging hour that you can have in the week. Let's pray together. Father God, we uh, come before you um, uh, uh, just a, a reeling, uh, confused, worrisome, hurt nation um, in a world that is experiencing in other nations the exact same thing. And the world seems to be uh, just going through this really, really strange moment right now. And people are being laid off and sickness is ravaging uh, everybody around us. And, and it just seems that, that the times have appeared darker lately than they have in, in, in some time now, God. But God, I pray right now that every single person realizes that your kingdom is not needing to bail anybody else. That your kingdom is not reeling, it's not worried, it's not confused, it's not caught off guard. You have laid nobody off. You are still fully functioning on the throne in power and able to accomplish all it is that you've called us to accomplish. So God, may we adjust to your kingdom, not in hopes that your kingdom will adjust to where we're at. You have done all that needs to be done for victory, for, for gladness, for joy, for all of those things to happen right now, God. So we give these moments to you. We look forward to what you're going to do, what you're going to show us, and what you're going to teach us. God, more than anything, I pray that our nation, that the people around us, wake up and turn back to you, God. And I pray that this revives everybody back to a rela relationship with you, God. And give us the opportunity, Lord, please, as a church, to lead the way, to, to champion the cause, to reach out to the city, even though we can't actually touch the city, God, in this time of quarantine. 
but we know you're working, we know you're moving, and we know that these people need encouraged, God. So right now, will you meet with us? We'll give you the glory and the praise because you're still a great God, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
right, let's uh, get into what we're going to be talking about in the Bible. We're going to just continue on with our series that we have been looking at uh, the last couple of weeks in Hebrews. So uh, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to it in Hebrews uh, or on your tablet or your phone or whatever and uh, just uh, follow along uh, with us there in your living room, wherever you are. Hey, um, it's a little chilly in here. Anybody else cold? It's tough to tell jokes when there's no room in here, and I don't know if it... Probably wasn't good, so we'll just move on. Uh, We're in Hebrews. Hebrews, uh, the title of this morning's message that I want to talk to you about is uh, Why Jesus Only Works. Why Jesus Only Works. And our our, our memory verse is in Hebrews 3.12. It says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God, here's what I want to do. Uh, I am going to put that memory verse up on the screen right now. And since I have to do this awkwardness, then you have to do some awkwardness. Why don't you uh, repeat that memory verse together in the room where you're at right now uh, as you read through Hebrews 3.12. That idea uh, there in that memory verse is actually what we want to talk about. Because one of the big controversies that surrounds the book of Hebrews is this idea of of uh, that, that the writer, who we don't know who he is, introduces this idea of, of drifting away. And some say that this is about losing your salvation. Some say that this is not necessarily talking about that. What those terms basically mean is there are two camps. There is one camp that believes that if you are a Christian, if you are a believer, a follower of Jesus, and you make that decision, you can never lose that salvation. That is backed up by many, many verses in the Bible, and they will point to many of them and and say right there it says it, uh, where nothing can separate us from the love of God, and and, then they'll go through and they'll list those, and they're all great verses, and they all make a great point. Whereas here at Free Will Baptist uh, Churches, what we believe, is that there is the possibility of losing your salvation. In other words, just the same way that you chose to follow God, you can choose to walk away from God. Uh, We would then point to a lot of passages in Hebrews and say, here it is, this is where you see that. Now, in the days to come or in the weeks to come, we will be looking at this more in depth, but I don't want to spend too much time on that, but just know that that is kind of the context that we're coming from. So our sermon sentence for this morning is to keep from drifting away, and we're going to use that term, and we're going to let it be applied uh, or interpreted however it is that you want to interpret that, but to keep from drifting away, be reminded of who Jesus is. The reason that I say that is because the point of the book of Hebrews is not to make a a, a doctrinal discourse on whether or not you can or cannot lose your salvation. For Free Will Baptists, we rely heavily and lean heavily on this book in hopes that, that it will prove our point, but it was not written from that context. Nor do I want to preach it from that context, but I do want to, in some ways, address this idea of drifting away. Now you say, where in the world does it come from? Well, that brings us to where we're going to be at in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. The uh, thing that we are paying much more closer attention to that he is talking about here uh, is the message of salvation, the story of uh, Jesus and what he did on the cross. And the idea of drifting away gives us the image in the original language of a book or a, a, a boat that sits in the middle of a pond or a, uh, a pond would be a poor example of a river more like. And what you realize is that if that boat is sitting there and it's not anchored, it drifts drifts and floats away. So it is slowly fading or drifting away from the point that it was at. And the language of this text wants you to get that in your head because that is a great analogy and a great way of understanding what it is they're saying. So therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. In other words, we need something to anchor us lest we drift away from it because the currents of this world and the currents of life are slowly moving us away from those for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution 
How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. For it was not to the angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet now and putting everything in subjection to him. He left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering." For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I'll tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted." Now, there's a lot of really incredible things to point out in these passages here, but I want to spend a couple of minutes to talk about something that we see here. Now, in verses 1 through 4, you see that it says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, right? Uh, if we don't pay attention closely to what we have heard, or if we're not reminded, if we don't go back to what it is that we need to be reminded of constantly, we will drift away from it. I want you to understand something, especially now in this time. As you are kept in your homes, kept from gathering together, kept from doing normal life and trying to readjust life and figure out what a new normal is. You have been shed of all distractions that could get in the way. Some of you have been laid off from jobs that you had to go to that created so much busyness and you are finding yourselves amongst your family, in with your family, spending far more time than you have spent in a long time and trying to adjust to it all. And it's been difficult and it's been a rough week and I get that. But I want you to pay attention to this opportunity that God has given us. See, the opportunity that God has given us in this is that he now has the opportunity to catch your attention. And you know why you need your attention captured? Because you have and are in danger of drifting away from center. God calls us to make him the center of our lives. And if we go about life not addressing the things that we need to address, and if we go about life not doing the things that we need to be doing, not paying attention to the things that we have been paying, what we needed to pay attention to, we will find ourselves drifting away from center. This is a time that we can recall in our lives what is center. And the, the passage goes on to explain to us, that what is being talked about, that anchor that is needed in our life, is Jesus. 
He gets real frustrated later in the book because uh, he's really aggravated about the idea that he has to keep going back to these elementary principles, teaching the basics of salvation, and it's not the real meat of the word, and it really frustrates him because they should be graduated well past that. But I think there's a teaching in that that we need to pay attention to as well. We must always remain anchored in Jesus Christ and what it is that he's called us to do. If we don't, the natural motion of life is to drift away. Pay attention to that. Be careful of a casual Christianity or a casual following of Jesus. Understand the cost of salvation that is brought up in that. And there's only one way to keep from drifting. And that is to remind yourself that only, 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 especially in this time, you need to hear this message because it's really important, especially in this time, only Jesus keeps us where we need to be. Now, verses 1 through 4, we'll come back to. We'll come back to it in a couple of minutes, but I want to talk to you about this idea of Jesus only. Why is it that Jesus only works? And in, in other words, if Jesus said that he's the only way to heaven, if he said that he's the only way to the Father, you got to understand the exclusivity that that gives the gospel message. There is no other religion that will work. It's only Jesus. There is no other way that will make sense. It's only Jesus. And if it's only Jesus, and that is such a bold and, and huge claim, then we've got to examine that and figure out why is it that it is only Jesus that works. Logically, it fits. It really does, and, and that, that's one of the things that we uh, learn as we study the Bible and get into the depths of theology. You can see that, that the logic of why Jesus only works actually fits. It, it makes sense when you understand it. So I want to point out a few things real quick to you. Four things before we come back to verse 4 and then bring it home. First of all, the reason that Jesus only works is because he is our champion. <laughs> Have you noticed, uh, if you watch the news, um, it, depending on what news source you go to or how you get your news, you know what everybody's looking for right now? They're hoping that a champion will raise up. <laughs> They're hoping that there will be someone that will uh, know how to fix this virus and this situation that we find ourselves in our world, that a cure will come from a, a doctor that gets some sort of understanding and it will be push through or that Trump will be able to figure out the, the, the mess that he is that is before him and that he will be the leader that he needs to be and step up and save our country and this recession and all these things that are going on. Uh, we can understand this idea of needing a champion. We need someone like us. It, it can't be us. See, none of us are sitting here saying, hey, uh, I bet I could figure out this coronavirus thing and none of us are at home running tests, uh, the best that I can tell, and, and saying, hey, I bet I can figure Figure this thing out. If I just had uh, a little bit of baking soda, and, and and you know, you're you're not going coming up with your own home test because none of us think that we are able to be the champion, and that fits in life. How many times have you found yourself realizing that you're just as confused as the people that you're trying to help? You're just as broken as the people that you're reaching out to. How many times have you found yourself in situations that you are overwhelmed and buried by what you're facing, realizing that you need someone to rescue you to save you from this? We understand the idea of a champion. It's talked about in the Bible. It's talked about, in fact, in this passage. See, Jesus was... As we talked about in the last couple of sermons, Jesus was fully God and fully man. And the reason that that works so well is because we need someone with the power of God himself. And we need someone with the experience of man himself able to come together in some sort of super being to be able to save us and to stand up and fight for us. Fight the battle that we can't 
fight. That's why we need the power. But it's our battle. That's why we need the person like us. And Jesus is the only person, the only claim made that he is fully God and fully man. Not half God and half man because that wouldn't be enough, but fully God and fully man. He is the champion and he fought for us. And that's what the first part of this passage is talking about, right? Jesus is the greatest champion that we can find, but here's the problem. The problem is we're still spending so much of our time and so much of our days looking for someone to fight for us. You even may be here this morning, sitting in your living room or wherever you are, wondering who's going to fight for you, who's going to save you, who's going to be the power that steps in. And the claim of the Bible is that Jesus is that champion and has already stepped in. Death is defeated. All things are bowing in his presence and then all things will bow in his presence one day. He is the champion that has fought for us. What, who or what is it that you're trusting to fight for you? Because if it is anything other than Jesus, I'm going to tell you, it will fall short. They will fall short. They cannot carry that burden. Not only is he our champion, but the next thing that we see in verses 14 through 16 is that he is our deliverer. He is our deliverer. When turmoil came upon the children of Israel, they looked for a deliverer and Moses rose up and he was the one that rescued them, right? That story translates over and the better Moses comes along as we'll see here in Hebrews later on. Jesus is greater than that. He is the great deliverer that has come to save us. Since therefore the children share in the flesh and the blood, he himself likewise partook of the same Things that through death, the very thing that we can't be delivered from, he dove headfirst into, went directly into death, and has overcome the carrier and the controller of death, devil himself, and is the victor. He has delivered us from the place that we cannot deliver ourselves from. Let me ask you a question. Who or what else are you hoping will deliver you? Maybe if it's even in this time, in this scare, in this worrisome struggle that you're going through, what is it that you're hoping will deliver you? If you're a follower of Jesus, can I please, please remind you, you have already been delivered from the worst fates that can come your way. Jesus is the deliverer that has overcome death. And so therefore, everything else is just small compared to the victory that he has given us already. Now the next part, I want to spend some time. I want to spend a little bit of time here because it's important that you see this because uh, it may be a little bit confusing and uh, uh, it, it may not make sense and, and we'll come back to it later in the book of Hebrews. But the third point that I want to point out to you this, this morning is that not only is Jesus our champion, not only is he our deliverer, but he's also our priest. In all places in the Bible, from cover to cover, it seems, there is this idea of, of man being represented, humans being represented by someone before God. Uh, in the uh, Old Testament, you saw it as the priest, and then Moses represented the, the people of, of children of Israel as he went onto the mountain and received uh, the law from God. And then the Levites were given that, uh, that, that position and that place throughout the rest of the Old Testament. And then uh, we see that the pastors and all of that is given in the, the New Testament. And, always, and, and it doesn't mean that we can't come before God, but there is what seems to always be someone that represents us. It fits into our legal system also, right? Uh, we don't just throw our people to the legal system, uh, but rather to go through the legal system properly, they are given a lawyer. That lawyer represents them. Uh, whether or not the lawyer thinks they are innocent or guilty, their job is to fight for their innocence. That's why uh, some cases look so strange as you see this case that this person is arguing, this lawyer is arguing, and you're like, can you really believe that? But you got to understand, his job is to represent his client. He's representing his client before the court of law. And that's so hard to understand, but, but it makes sense in the context of the Bible. We need someone that is a priest, someone that will and can represent us. Jesus is referred to as the high priest. 
the high priest. Um, when we are looking at this theme in the Bible, you'll see it in, in Hebrews quite a bit. But the priest, the high priest, was the one that was chosen to go into the Holy of Holies. Only one person was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies each year. This one priest was the high priest chosen to approach that area. No one else was. He was to represent all the people. He was to be cleansed and go through the rituals first and then to walk into the Holy of Holies, represent the people, make the sacrifice. He was their representative. The Bible tells us later on in Hebrews that since Jesus is the high priest, we can now, since he has paved the way and done what no other earthly high priest could do, he's represented us in a way that no other person could. Now we can boldly go before the throne of God. Jesus is our priest. Can I ask you a question? Who or what... Are you asking to represent you? Who or what are you hoping will go before God for you? Maybe if it's even me as a pastor. You have come to me in hopes that, that uh, I would go on your behalf before God. And, and, and maybe you've gone to a priest and you've confessed your sins in some way. And that priest has said to you that they could forgive your sins or whatever it may be. Your goal is that you don't want to approach God yourself, but you need someone to represent you. Can I let you know something? According to the New Testament and the teachings in the Bible, we cannot represent you before God. Whether a pastor or a priest, we don't have that place or that privilege anymore. Jesus is the high priest. He's the only one that can represent you before God. He's the only one that can argue your case. He's the only lawyer you can have that will win the case and make it sense, make sense. So if you're looking towards someone else, your wife, your husband, to represent you before God, please, please understand it won't work. Jesus is offered as the high priest. He's our champion, he's our deliverer, he's our priest. And then verse 18 shows us not only those things, but he is our way maker. This is why Jesus only works. He guides us, right? He guides us. He has the way. And there are so many other ways in this world being offered up. There are so many other places that are saying to us, here is some way you can do it, or here is some thing you can use to fix it. And so we're going through those ways, hoping that that will be the magic pill or the, the magic fix. Jesus is given to us in John 1, he's presented as the word, the word of God. The direction, the, the spoken word, the, the, the proclamation of who God is, Jesus is that. He is the only navigation system that makes sense and gives us the proper directions. Can I ask you a question? Who or what else are you relying on to make the way for you? In other words, what is guiding you? What are you hoping in? What is it that you're trusting for direction? Some of you have trusted in the economy in, in hopes that it will guide you to the end of your life because your, your hope has been that you have built up enough security so that when you get to the end, it will be there. And all of a sudden, this week has left the world underneath you shaken and you've realized that the way that you have been following is now on shaky ground. Stocks have plummeted. Your retirement has crumbled. Things have fallen apart and you have trusted in the wrong way. Some of you have relied on your job. You've hoped that your job, the, the normalcy of your job and the day-to-day -day grind and the provisions of all of that have made sense. And it is in that way that you thought that life would be what it needed to be. So you've poured your energy and your effort and you've sacrificed so much of your family and, and your relationship with God in hopes that you will reach that place that your job is taking you. And now all of a sudden in this time and in this place, you've realized that was a poor, poor guide. For many of us, the things that have guided us are being taken out from under us right now. 
the gods that we have held up have been shaken and torn and left to show their weakness. And remember what the problem is that we're trying to avoid. See, the problem was in verse 1, right? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Pay careful attention to the things that you've heard, lest you should drift away. See, I'm afraid that where we're at in the church right now, unable to gather together, unable to meet together with each other, unable to go to the grocery store, unable to trust our government, unable to hope in the things that we've hoped in, has left us in this place, in this world where we're struggling. Because what we have done is we have placed our anchor in so many other things, and all of a sudden now, in this moment, as it's slowed down and we've stopped for just a little while, we've looked around, and you know what we've realized? As we're looking around right now, many of us are saying, we're not where we're supposed to be. We've drifted. I'm supposed to be over there. I was supposed to be doing that, but now I have allowed the waves and the the currents of life to cause me to drift from where I was called. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Jesus is your champion. Jesus is your deliverer. Jesus is your priest. Jesus is your way maker. He fights for you. He reclaims you. He represents you. And he guides you. And anything short of that, anything short of what Jesus offers in those areas, will leave you disappointed and drifting. So how do we respond this morning? What's the take it home, even though you're home? What is it that we do with this message? I want to challenge you, first of all, to acknowledge today in your own living room, in your own time, and in your own space. Acknowledge today that you're clinging to something or someone other than Jesus. See, you first have to acknowledge what your anchor is. You first have to acknowledge that your anchor has not been secure and you have found yourself drifting because it's not what you had heard before. It's not what you had surrendered to. It's not the call that you had on your life when you came and you knelt down and you surrendered in that place at that time and you gave your heart to Jesus and then you got up and you forgot So today, acknowledge that you're clinging to something or someone other than Jesus. And then in this time when it's all messed up and normal is not normal, and you don't know what the future is, and you don't know if they're going back to school or if you're going back to work or if this is going to be over next week or if it's going to be over next month, or you don't know. Notice, notice though how much you have drifted In your relationship with Christ. Notice how much you have allowed yourself to slowly fade away. I'm not saying that you are uh, in that place where you you are declaring that you don't believe in God. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that notice that your life has drifted closer to that place than it was when you decided to follow Jesus. And then I want to challenge you. This morning, as we get ready to finish up, spend some time returning to Jesus this morning. Hey, if if you're watching this, maybe it's your first time here at Keystone. Maybe it's your first time to be a part of our service and you're just checking us out and that's great. Here's the message we have for you. Jesus is the greatest answer to every single question that there is. Jesus is the great healer, and this world needs a healer. He's the great redeemer, and this world needs redeems. And for you, as your sins have caused you to drift away from where you're supposed to be, please understand that we serve a Savior 
that was like us. And in every way he was tempted like us, yet without sin. So he understands. He doesn't sit on a throne looking down, waiting to whack us with a holy two by four every time we mess up. But rather he sits there in a place of victory, knowing what it's like because he's experienced what it is that we've experienced. And he loves you. Your sins have not drifted you too far away from coming back. There is still a lifeline thrown out to you in your place. And his hope is that you will only grab the rope and he will pull you to safety. So if you're here and you don't know where you stand with God, if you're watching this and you don't know, I want to challenge you to get that taken care of right now. I don't have to be there. I'm not your representative. Jesus is. I don't have to do anything for you. Jesus has done it all for you. Here's how we believe that you can do that. The Bible says that if we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, we confess our sins to him. If we we ask him to save us, it is in that moment that he does save us. And I want you to know that right now where you're at, whatever you're going through, if you're experiencing the fear and the turmoil of your sins or everything that's going on, Jesus can save you. I'm going to close with a prayer. And if God is dealing with your heart, I'm going to ask you just to spend some time in quietness. Just a few more minutes as you pray. God, I thank you that I have the opportunity to be able to do this really, really strange thing. But you're a great God. You knew this was coming. God, I miss our people. I miss getting to be with everybody. I miss getting to shake hands and hug necks and encourage. But God, I'm going to use this time to remind myself of what it is that you've called me to. My anchor still holds. And I'm tethered to Jesus. My hope is you. My victory is is you. My healing is you. God, if there's someone here watching this this morning and they have not surrendered their life to you, God, I pray that they start right now, right here in that relationship with you. God, give them the courage to reach out to us so that we can contact them and walk them through this so that we can help them. And when all of it's done, God, what we're going to do is we're going to turn around and give you the glory and the praise because we love you. And you're the only one that works. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for uh, just being in service with us. Remember, the children's ministry will come right after this. You'll be able to watch it. I encourage the families to watch it together. Uh, Everything's canceled here at the church. We're not doing uh, any activities. So the manor, any of that Bible study or Financial Peace University, it's not going on. Uh, But we do ask that you still continue to give if you are able. And also on that same lines, if there is a need that you have, you need groceries, you need help, you need anything, please make sure that you contact us because we are still open for business doing stuff like that, right? Check us out on Facebook, on YouTube, all those places. We're going to be doing everything that we can right now, amping up our resources, amping up our activity, amping up all of the the noise that we can in all those different places. We want to be the most encouraging thing in the city of Greensburg as we fight this virus. Pray for each other. Contact each other. I'm begging you, church, don't stop being the church. Don't stop being the church at this time. Contact each other. Call one another. Don't just text. Don't just send a message. Don't just like something. Please, I'm begging you, contact each other. That's important. Listen to each other's voice. Listen to each other's uh, worries and concerns and be there for each other. Don't try to brush over it like it's no big deal because it is a big deal. So listen to each other and be there for each other. I love you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for our city, and I believe that God's got great things coming in the future. So keep your head up and keep going. If you need encouragement every single day, we have the encouraging uh, quarantine devotion that happens 
every single day at 6 o'clock, 6 a.m., it releases on YouTube or on Facebook. You can watch it later if you're not up at 6 a.m., but I want to encourage you to check that out. For this sermon that we just had, if you want to study it a little bit further, the devotions are available on your app uh, where you can give, where you can keep up with all that kind of stuff, so download the app. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Love you. Love you and your family. Praying for you guys.